brought with me a candle. I'm not going to light it for you. You may think I get somewhat romantic or host some sort of vigil. No, I'm not going to light it because actually the fire code prevents me from doing so here in the studio. But I brought my candle because the great scientist from the 19th century, Michael Faraday, Michael Faraday once said that the best way to study natural philosophy was to look at the physical phenomena of a candle. I'm going to be your energy philosopher here for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. But let me start by telling you that uh, I've worked in energy all my life, over 30 years. Started out in the oil and gas business. 10, 15 years ago, I started to follow the what was then called alternative energy or energy technology companies. Today, they're called clean tech. Also followed coal and nuclear. Got a sense for what was happening in those worlds. And I have to tell you, in my over 30-year career, this is the most exciting period in energy that I've seen. This is the most exciting period of change and the magnitude of the changes that are happening, even in the last 18 months, two years, are just staggering. It's really, uh, it's really an amazing period. And I can tell you that in the oil and gas business, as a student of history, where I collect energy antiques and antiquarian books, but in the oil and gas business, the magnitude of the changes that we're seeing, I said, even in the last couple of years, are of an order of magnitude, similar to what we saw 100 years ago. So what I want to do today is chart out for you what's going to happen over the course of the next five, 10 years. Because you know, the world is in an energy predicament. And what is that energy predicament we have been living for the last 10, 15 years or so? There's seven billion people on the planet, Two billion of those people on the other side of the world are getting wealthier every day. Wealth and energy consumption go hand in hand. In fact, the wealthier you get, it's a step jump in energy consumption. The most scalable and easy to access energy sources for growth are the fossil fuels. The fossil fuels, of course, are encumbered. They're encumbered with environmental issues. In the case of oil, we also have geopolitical issues and potential issues of scarcity, which drive the price up. Well, fossil fuels are also very wonderful in their utility. I mean, take oil, for example. On one tank of diesel, you can drive probably from here to Vancouver. Imagine pushing a car yourself over the mountain passes on a tank, the, the price of a tank of gas. But it is a predicament because there is a real air of unsustainability about what's going on. Right. Yet there is change in the air. Some interesting changes, changes that you may not actually really be thinking about that are very exciting. And I want to tell you about those changes. And nowhere actually are those changes in a more leading position than here in Canada, actually, than here in Canada. Well, let me philosophize for you. Let me philosophize for you with a candle. You know, in 1692, after centuries of being used, the candle makers were under assault. They were under assault by a new technology. The technology was a convex lens and also a whale oil lantern. Whale oil being a new fuel that challenged the candles. Candles back then were largely made from tallow. Tallow being animal fat, largely basically bacon fat used to make candles. The introduction of a new fuel and a convex lens. The convex lens inserted in a lantern diffused the light more easily, meaning it was more efficient. And therefore, the lantern used less tallow and less candles. This was viewed as a big threat. What did the candle makers do, or the chandlers, as they were called? The chandlers do as what everybody in and around the energy business does. They went to the government. They went to the government with this document. How do I know that? Because I own this document from 1692, which was in London. And there it is, I call it social media. It was distributed to people to petition the aldermen of London for reasons against the convex lights, etc., and the whale oil lanterns. If these lamps and lucidaries are allowed to come into our society, it will threaten the labor of thousands. In other words, it will put thousands of us out of business, the chandlers and the wick makers. If it didn't work, 
as is so often the case, I would say, when you go to the government. Well, a lamp on the left, and there is a lantern in my collection with a convex lens uh, of the time. The candle makers had more problems to contend to. By 1709, the British government introduced a candle tax, a tax on every candle. I diarize this as the first carbon tax. <laughs> People do. And what did the innovators do? They innovated with this device over here, which was not really an innovation. It was actually a retro step. And this candle I can light from. So that was a high value taxed candle, which gave off a really decent quality of light. However, when faced with candle tax, society, particularly the impoverished who could not afford candles, went backwards and they went to rush lights. In other words, they used rush stalks from a, from a bull rush dipped in animal fat. Didn't last very long, it stank, it sputtered, was unsafe compared to the candle, which was a better technology. You can diarize this as unintended consequences of hasty government policy. The candle makers sought new markets, being under threat, of course, to the colonies, America. But the Americans, who are now well entrenched with their whale oil industry on Nantucket, did not want the cheap candles coming in from the UK. So they introduced an import duty. The import duty was fought by the candle makers in the United States, who wanted to compete on a level ground. So this document here talks about wanting to repeal the import tax. But the candle makers had far more things to think about and far more threats. This time, in the early 1800s now, gas lighting. Gas from heating up coal was coming in. Beautiful lamps, as was diarized by a gentleman named Frederick Acume, who wrote this book in 1815. And he noted, after doing the economic calculations and the technical assessments of gas lights in his early days in London in 1815, he basically said, watch out whale oil, watch out candles. As the gas lights are more or less generally adopted in all towns of the country, the consumption of whale oil and tallow will be diminished. Basically, he's basically writing off the candle industry, isn't he? With this new technology coming in. Well, that wasn't the end of the competitive assault. The candle makers then had to endure, of course, in the late 1850s, certainly 1860s, the emergence of a new fuel, rock oil, or crude oil as we know it today, which the technology was then introduced by a Canadian, Mr. Abraham Gessner, a Nova Scotian, to distill it into kerosene. Now, whale oil lamps, coal gas lanterns, candles had to compete with kerosene lamps. It was indeed becoming a very competitive fray. One would be inclined to write off the candle industry in the 1800s, but no. No. As is so often, the incumbent in a business who's been around for centuries does not lie back and just take it. The incumbent fights back. And so it was that a great effort started to go into understanding the science of candles and the physical phenomena, and no less than the famous Michael Faraday with his 1861 book. I own this book, among many others. It's actually a series of lectures. Mr. Faraday actually gave a series of lectures to the public, to young people, in layman's terms. It's very easy to read. But also furthered the science and chemistry of understanding how to make a better candle. A candle, for example, that didn't have that black soot coming up, which really was the pollutant in homes, and which really was not competitive with the much cleaner burning kerosene lamps, for example. Further research and development and engineering, the candles, instead of being handmade individually, were mass produced. Economies of scale and engineering technologies in production in the process of making candles took root. The manufacture of soap and candles by a Mr. W.T. Brandt, probably not a bestseller in its day, but uh, in my collection nevertheless. Here are some devices that showed how candle making was made more efficient. He notes, of all the means of artificial illumination, candles are perhaps the most convenient and the materials of which they can be made are generally easily obtained. 
and many of them cheap in cost. And therein lies the key. Therein lies the key. To compete, you have to have a better product, and you have to have it at a lower cost. And people will buy it. And the incumbent, when challenged, always seeks to compete by improving their product and reducing their costs. Well, I think we know how the story ended. The light bulb came in and effectively put kerosene lanterns, whale oil lamps, coal gas lamps, and candles out of business. But it wasn't really that abrupt. The electric light bulb pioneered and demonstrated among others, Edison, in 1879. It actually took 25 or 30 years to get the mass production going. And it actually took almost 80 to 100 years before every home in North America actually had electricity and adopted the light bulb. The change of entrenched systems generally takes a long time. It happens. And along the way, the processes get more efficient through competition. So where do we take it from here? What are the lessons that we can learn for my interesting but arguably trite story about candles? Well, we can take away some lessons for the oil industry, maybe even in the oil sands business. I ask, where is the Michael Faraday of today who's willing to write a common sense book that's easily accessible to the layman to understand process and product improvements that are going on, such that everybody can understand that indeed it is improving as a competitive response. There are, though, much deeper meanings here, I think, in this tale of the candles, one that is manifesting itself right now and most acutely, actually, in the Canadian oil and gas industry. You see, Canada's oil and gas industry today is the fourth largest industry in the world. It is an incumbent. It was one of the first, actually, to pioneer oil in 1859. It's not about to roll over in the face of competition, yet it is an industry that, relative to the rest of the world's other oil industries and producers, has had to endure an intense amount of environmental scrutiny, and I'm not saying that's bad at all. An intense price pressure selling our products, both our oil and our gas, at very steep discounts, arguably the cheapest in the world. And more recently, the sole customer of Canadian oil and gas in the last three to five years has basically said, you know what, I'm not sure I need as much of your stuff anymore. I've got enough of my own. And even more recently, saying not only do I have enough of my own, I'm going to compete with you. Well, this is a sea change. Right? We used to always rely on Americans to buy every barrel of oil and every cubic foot of gas that we could produce in excess. And today, there's head-on-head -head competition. And shale gas, conventional gas, the rise of the light-tight oil, if you follow it, the new processes and techniques, revitalizing old oil fields over 100 years ago in Texas. Think about that. Only a handful of years ago, where the oil sands at 170 billion barrels were considered the last bastion of oil to be found of any size. That was only 2007 8. I was at a conference a few weeks ago. They're saying now in the Permian Basin there's 50 billion barrels in one play alone, one third the size of the oil sands. The industry is now going to experience intense competition. Players in the Canadian oil and gas business really know it. Certainly the progressive ones do. I see very positive signs. I see signs that there is a renewed emphasis, much as the candle makers, improving the product, understanding it in the labs, making it better, making it cleaner, improving the processes that go along with it. You know, the oil and gas industry really hasn't had to innovate that much since Oh, the 1980s when I started in the business? You know, in the 1980s, they were shutting down research labs. Well, why would they do that? Of course they would do that. So my customers are addicted to the product, and there's no competition. Today, there's competition. 
And Canada is a leading microcosm because of its circumstances of that competition. The progressive producers are innovating. This is not something that is a 2007-8 story. This is something that's like a 2011-12, certainly 13 story and beyond. So here's what's going to happen. The competition is going to intensify. The progressive producers are going to become much more efficient in offering a better product, a more efficient low-cost product. The competition is going to also spread into the United States, and then it's going to go global as exports, which are already happening, start to hit the shores of other countries. The oil industry is going to come out stronger than it was before. It's going to become more efficient. Now, that's a bit troublesome for me to stand up and say that. And I have no incentive to say that because I just am an observer of all the energy systems. But is that a bad thing in our society? Right? We are, the reality is we are not going to get off fossil fuels for many decades. So at least let's try and make the processes more efficient in bringing it. Because efficiency and cost reduction go hand in hand with lower emissions as well. You use less water, you use less energy, less trucks going around. The processes are going to make dramatic changes in the efficiency of the product. And as I say, as it goes global, it's going to be a positive thing. Yet, that may trouble you to think that there's longevity in a rejuvenated oil business. We can't just stand around and point to the oil industry and say, clean up your act. That's the supply side. There's incumbent responsibility upon all of us as a society. If we are really intent upon reducing the emissions, the demand side has to respond as well. And this is where I'm really excited because I see a lot of convex lenses emerging on the demand side. So what can you do? Well, you see convex lenses, such as LED light bulbs, fuel-efficient vehicles, embrace and adopt them. Reducing energy consumption actually has a double benefit of reducing emissions at the end, consumption, but also tightening up the competition on the supply side who has to compete for market share in a diminishing demand environment. Ultimately, what can you do? Yes, buy a convex lens, buy an LED light bulb, become more efficient in your home, in your own personal processes. Ultimately, the best thing you can do is turn a light off when you're not using it. And at this point, I would blow up my candle. Thank you very much.